This is Baldur's Gate 3. To some of you that already played it, know exactly what I'm going for in this video. Maybe you have no clue as to what this game is about other than being a solid game of the year contender. But worry not since I educate you about a video game lifetime experience that the industry will probably never replicate. I am dead serious. I've dedicated over 200 hours playing a local co-op campaign with my partner. The story we shared together and even separately with our romantic options has been so unique and special. It's so self-aware of the actions you take during the story that you will feel welcomed in this world without the need of having to play the previous titles, in contrast to other video games I've played over the past years. That, considering 2023, has been off the charts when it comes to excellent games. What I'm thinking about recognized and awarded video games, third-person action adventures or action RPGs come to mind. It's pretty much the favorite genre for people to choose from. And I guess it has to do with how much you're in control with the character and how immersive you're in the game. Third-person perspective gives this intimate connection between the player, the protagonist, and the characters in very interesting ways, and allegedly with much more freedom. So how does a title like Baldur's Gate 3 will resonate to other kinds of players? The ones who are not used to turn-based RPGs? That of course, is just a perception because a studio like Larian had already won awards in the past with their previous franchise, Divinity Original Sin. And in fact, there's actually a lot of third-person interaction in this game along with the classic over-the-top camera that will immerse players in a world full of surprises, complex stories, and open-ended battles. <laughs> Most games nowadays are usually focused on revealing the world to the players without asking them or without letting them discover. Too much exposure might end up on a disconnection of the narrative over time. The narrative in Baldur's Gate 3 is expansive and enriching every second you play. But the game invites players to uncover the mysteries of the world surrounding the Forgotten Realm by themselves for every action we take. The story starts with a sudden invasion of a giant nautiloid all over Baldur's Gate and his attempt of mass abducting hundreds of innocent lives. You start your journey inside that ship with a sadistic aberration known as the Mind Flayer, whereas the unique purpose is to insert a tadpole within your pupillae so you can eventually turn into one of them. It all seems like the worst ending you could possibly pull out of from a long campaign until the ship suffers damage and falls from the sky to the Faerun. While you manage to escape, the game suggests you to forge uneasy alliances with a dark priestess who lost her memory, a ruthless Gintiaki who craves for battle, a vampiric elf who doesn't hesitate to kill his own comrades to save himself. So the tadpole allows us to influence others. How very interesting. And the many many wacky interesting characters you will meet during campaign. So yeah, now you will have to decide to either find a cure to this tadpole or succumb to its tempting psionic abilities. After that, the world is yours to explore as the story unfolds from the depths of the Underdark, the townsfolk near the Faerun, to the shadow-cursed lands, to eventually Baldur's Gate. The game successfully replicates the Dungeons & Dragons tabletop experience in the best way possible. Considering that D&D is already the ultimate role-playing experience, one that has even been in the video game hall of fame due to his influences in the video game industry, Baldur's Gate 3 is mainly focused on five aspects. Exploration, combat, role-playing, management, and a little bit of date sim. The world can be fully explored and every choice you take has consequences, which also means you can also not take any choices 
or chances to some missions. But even that can also have consequences. There will be companions that were previously kidnapped in the same ship and will ask you to join your fellowship for a possible cure. Which, of course, can bond a great friendship with you or even a romance. There is no narrative dissonance in this story that I've seen in other games where all the characters are fixated on the events of your main objective. As you explore, you will find out many characters that have their own struggles and issues to deal with, whether it is a widow trying to revive his husband with the help of an entrusty saga, a complete race of deeply migrating from their lands while facing discrimination, or a woman trying to kidnap the only child from a Ginthiak incubator while destroying local traditions. To this and many of the dozens of stories, you will find multiple ways of solving them. The narrative was created by historians and skilled writers working in all these ramifications, making their role-playing options feel a lot more meaningful and natural. If light is the symptom, then darkness is the cure. For in light there is presence, but in darkness there is absence. Sometimes you can't even talk to someone due to your race or class background. What business have you in a crash dormitory, Stick? Move along. Other times that may be to your advantage. If you're looking for the young ones, they're with the Savash in combat drills. You can help the widow by reviving her husband only to find severe consequences in later parts of the story that I won't spoil. Even saving the Tiflin immigrants could have terrible consequences that are hard to bear in later parts of the story. These encounters will happen all the time and will unravel gigantic storylines that weren't in your radar in the first place while also telling the socio-political stand in Baldur's Gate 3. Bioware fans will probably feel very, very welcomed here. I think I've never confessed my obsession for character creation, up to the point that I might want to make a full-length videos reviewing each and every one I've tried. And let me tell you, Baldur's Gate 3 has a very detailed one, with tons of classes, races, sub-races to choose from. When it comes to genre, you can choose to be binary to non-binary and pick the body style, genitals included. If you're a dragonborn, there are a lot of types of scales. For tieflings, there are tons of horns. Trolls, elves, halflings, dwarves, and humans have tons of faces, ear shapes, and so on. Hairstyles can be mixed between two colors with beautiful outcomes. It's not as complex when it comes to shaping faces and body, but the results are pretty good. Of course, the fun thing of D&D is to roll your dice to see what outcomes you will have and challenging situations. And trust me, you will be at the edge of your seat for every outcome and of course, you can gain an advantage depending on the stats you have. Some characters may be more persuasive than others, while sometimes it is best to intimidate. It's so fascinating to see the countless possibilities. For instance, I, as a druid, can't talk to animals, opening up entire conversations that could be hidden to other classes. Afraid. Afraid of them. Do not think on it further. There are others that can talk to the dead and can give us important clues to solve missions. Also, you can change in between your party members to trigger different conversations. You can explore alone or up to four party members, including your local partner, and each and every character will have different outcomes. You will find areas that are meant for a specific character like the Underdark ruins related to Shadowheart's beliefs. Even as a companion, they might trigger a lot of interesting conversation plots. Of course, a talker like Astarion has a lot to say about pretty much anything. <clears throat> you have the ability to manipulate people, make them bend to your every whim, and you'd be cautious about it. <laughs> That's no fun. Other NPCs will join your companionship in important parts of the story, and you may think this will come easy as any other secondary NPC, but oh no. Even when someone joins you, 
You can feel a turmoil in between party members. Sometimes characters can have the choice to leave if you're careless or because they simply can't stand other companions. I hope I didn't scare any of you. By how the game sounds, you may think it's really difficult, but in fact it isn't. It's really accessible and open-ended compared to Divinity Original Sin at least. The game constantly teaches you the many options and role-playing mechanics without overwhelming players. If you made an unwanted decision, you can load back to your progress, which is also known by the community as SCOM SAVING. Sometimes I shamelessly use it all the time. Yeah, I don't care, I said it. Also, the narrative is very fun and comedic at times, making it feel much more natural and relatable to people. I like her. She looks like she could throw me over her shoulder and carry me to safety, should the need arise. I'd hug you if it wouldn't scorch your skin off. I just don't know why other studios forget about this, but it is so essential that conversations between characters feel natural and genuine to how thinking creatures would react and sound like in real life. Plus, comedy and romance are totally underrated in video games. Perhaps there are not that many opportunities for writers to expand game stories with it, but Baldur's Gate 3 has plenty of them and quite enjoyable too. Even the narrative in co-op makes Baldur's Gate 3 the best local title I've ever played. I haven't tried the online multiplayer, but I'm pretty sure it is somewhat similar. Usually, co-op and story-driven games are not that great in general. Usually the second player is a sidekick, a player whose only purpose is to assist and break havoc, without having a personal progress. Sometimes it can be fun, but most of the time I've felt a strong narrative dissonance, in a bad way. But Baldur's Gate 3 is not the case. Each player has a unique storyline of their own with their own race and classes while contributing to the narrative in unique ways. Just like D&D, my partner has her own unique style of talking to NPCs and making her own choices. Sometimes she succeeds in crucial conversations while I failed in others. She does have an evolving and loving relationship with Shadowheart. Considering all we've been through, I think I was very lucky to find such favorable company. And attractive company too, no less. While I choose to have mine with Lacel for some reason. If it weren't apparent, it should be. I'm not keen on such outward displays of our flesh bond. And each of these interactions are not dependent on each other. For instance, me and my partner have a very different relationship with Will. Not to say I didn't develop a taste for good wine and the talent for courtly dance. <clears throat> it's been a badger's age since I've twinkled my toes. A drunk ogre could put on a better show. It's also a huge bonus playing this way because it feels we're both playing two different campaigns at the same time by watching other ramifications in the narrative. Fathers at Moonrise Towers, and we need to save him. Also, keep in mind that in any time of the campaign, you can easily separate the characters, whether it is local multiplayer and online multiplayer. Who knows if you're ever going to keep playing with that person. And yeah, that's another great thing that it wasn't in the script and I just remembered how great it is. Of course, there are some key parts of the story that we as a group have to come to an agreement on because otherwise will affect us all. But playing it in co-op gives you this second chance that expands your gaming experience in such fun and interesting ways. The combat follows the turn-based fashion of classic RPGs and trust me, it's one of the most engaging and open-ended combat you will ever, ever see in a video game. 
with so many possibilities and outcomes that will pretty much entitle your own style without ever making you feel limited. And you may think this is where you and the game will distance apart. You may be wishing this game to be a real-time action combat simply because you cannot dig turn-based RPGs. Well, excuse me! But if you can have a discussion online, you certainly have the patience to play that way. But that's another topic of discussion. As a curious fact, there's a tabletop mode where you can play the entire campaign in turns and at any time you want, which is actually pretty useful for overcoming traps or stealing your way on uncharted territory. Combat encounters can be triggered in different ways. You may simply enter in a fight with dangerous enemies or after a conversation, whether intentional or a failed attempt to settle things up. Similar to tactical RPGs, you have a limited amount of walkable distance to move, jump, hide, etc. In a Dungeons & Dragons fashion, each player has their own set of skills and magic spells to choose from, the weapons and also inventory items you may have gathered while exploring. In local co-op, the group is made up to four characters, where two of them are players and the other two are characters that can be assigned however you both pleased. It is also a great opportunity to bond a relationship with other characters during battle. I'll say that D&D is the ultimate sandbox experience when it comes to limitless combat, but Baldur's Gate 3 comes pretty close, far closer than many games in fact. You can choose simple physical attacks in close quarters or distance. You can enhance your physical attacks with bonus actions for many situations. You have an enemy over a cliff? You can try to push them. Have multiple enemies? Tackle them at the same time. Want to earn extra damage for tougher enemies? Gain rage and rampage bosses through and through. Magic spells can be combined in very fun ways. There's lightning, acid, fire, ice, psionic, necrotic, etc. Obviously, each enemy has a different weakness and strength. But wait, there's more. You can trigger certain effects in the environment with items and spells. Maybe your enemies are surrounded by water, so you can cast lightning and electrify them. You will see a pool of blood caused by one of the players and some warlock can use that blood to cast freeze and make the floor dangerous and slippery. And what about when you're out of spell casts? Well, of course, you can reach out to explosive items. But what if we simply wrap them out in a bag, throw it away from a safe distance, shoot in a row, so we can trigger a giant and bigger explosion? Yes, you can do that. Playing in combat co-op gives room to make fun strategies, but considering that we're both moving at our pace, it does require a little bit of teamwork to plan actions in advance. I can count many times that me or my partner passed over and changed the plans, like I know she is a weapon of mass destruction when it comes to magic spells. <laughs> so I'd rather wait for her to act first before stepping closer to the enemy. Of course, you don't have to plan all the time, it's part of the D&D fun, but when it happens, it triggers one of the most memorable fight scenes I can think of in any game I've ever played. It also helps the pacing of the music that keeps evolving depending on how good or bad you're doing, which pushes more and more the adrenaline bar. But seriously, the amount of freedom you have, it's astounding. You can carry a pile of boxes to gain height advantage and shoot enemies. You can simply choose to save whatever you're supposed to save and escape if you want. Like, I mean, I can keep going with the limitless amount of examples. And by the way, I know that in Dungeons & Dragons, every one of these choices requires you to roll the dice. But fear not, impatient gamers, because in Baldur's Gate 3 combats, 
every roll is made automatically. You can still watch the results though, leaving the roll of the dice on more slow paced moments in the narrative, maybe for dramatic purposes. As per leveling up and upgrading your character, this follows the same D&D mechanics where you level up every often depending on how much you explore and fight. You get to choose the unlocked abilities and change the ones you prefer. Some items might give more or less, but worry not since the game will guide you once you get there. There are tons of types of spells, combat arts, movement, passive abilities, actions, and so on. For every fight, it is vital to learn, rest, and a campsite for recovering health, skills, and spells. You see, in any other game, this could easily be in a simple menu and maybe with some characters in the background. But Larian took campsites very seriously, even more considering how enriching these are during D&D campaigns. Likewise, camps are an intimate space for social gathering, resting and even exploring. Having up to 17 different types of campsites depending on where we are resting. Each and every campsite even store things you might have left in there, like my paintings and book collection, for instance. Inventory boxes are for managing all that stuff, which I'll talk about in a second. The campsite is also the place where we can safely talk to other partners and get to know each other. Sometimes you might encounter fights in the middle of the night. Other times you will be safe keeping NPCs for as long as their mission goes. Some missions even require a long rest in the campsite for a couple of days to proceed. Party members can have a beef with each other and things could escalate in surprising ways. And the most spicy and wonderfully executed romances are happening here, in the campsite as well. But you... I don't want to hurt you. I want to protect you. For you to protect me. Dear Datesim fans, be wary that this is just a slide of this ever-expanding game, and your relationship with suitors might take longer than expected. At least, that's how it is now. Back in the early days, a lot of people went straight to bed in a couple of long rests until a later patch fixed it. Nowadays, romancing characters feels as close to life as talking to them. Well, maybe hornier now. Of course, it requires a first approach and answering the right answers. This is meant to be flattery, not poetry. Just tell me I'm beautiful and we can call it a day. Sometimes state might feel indisposed to flirt, so you should nurture the bonds by doing things he might enjoy, like hanging around or fighting alongside them. Honestly, I'd hoped for more from you, but perhaps things can yet be turned around. Consistency in your significant other will trigger a romantic encounter. Sometimes it is straight to the point sex. Other times are romantic nights with a bare first base contact. After that, you evolve your relationship to a more serious phase depending on how good you are to them. And depending on the characters, you could even have multiple relationships. As for who I can flirt with, basically almost anybody who joins the campsite except contractors, miners obviously, <coughs> some animals, and weathers. Fate spins along as it should. Hmm. In general, relationships do last through the whole campaign and can affect other characters' behavior. I just wish you can use other non-protagonists in between because, good lord, Karlak and Lacel are made for each other. Fuck yes! They cornered me outside the toll house just up the hill. Doubt they've gone far after the scorching I gave them. That or restart one of them as a protagonist and, yep, you can even do that. Voice acting is astounding and really well done, like they recorded about 178 hours of actors working on camera and voicing on the set. Again, all the experience makes this game so much more relatable to real life that it's so easy to recommend for anyone. There's a particular reason why it's so hard for fans to decide on their favorite characters, because again they all feel relatable or even despicable. 
And by the way, each member of the co-op campaign can safely romance fellow partners and have stories of their own. Also, everyone can listen to each other's conversations and sometimes ask them for stuff. I mean, it's so fascinating. One important aspect that Larian made pretty good was the inventory management. This is your typical inventory box limited by your weight, which you can empty at your campsite chests with infinite capacity. You can easily pick up items from other players, even in between other players at any time. You can also carry other types of bags that can carry items in itself. Ideal to classify your inventory or prepare a bag of goodies for any confrontation. The market is also interesting with options to gain discounts depending on your charisma and gifts you gave to sellers through bargaining. Again, so far, I don't feel limited by how much I can carry. And the menu in controllers is as good as a mouse and keyboard. And in fact, I recommend to actually try them both if you can. These wheels were pretty handy and easy to understand. You don't have to scroll all the way up every time you lose something. It's all there right where you left it off, and you can simply automatically add items or spells specifically on places you wish, and customize your wheels however you like. Again, I truly recommend Baldur's Gate 3 to everyone. It's a game that truly respects the time you commit to it by rewarding for every second you play and decisions that truly mean a lot in this story. It's a game that doesn't detach from the player and let them be part of this gigantic lore. It's a story that talks deeply about the mythos, without hesitating on going on difficult topics and wants to fill up every gap and choice you make to really matter. And it's one of the few games I can't stop thinking about after months of stop playing gives the feeling that you should really need to start a new campaign and see what outcomes you can have this time. One experience you will never relive in the same way. Also, this might sound very odd, but I cannot think of any other game where the game patches and updates are actually as exciting as in Baldur's Gate 3. They're actually the main keystone in the community where the studio keeps listening to fans ever since early access days. Aside from patches that heavily improve on performance and fixing bugs, they include new dialogue options, epilogues, new game modes, and more. They even revert back our furry friend Your Majesty to go back as our beloved Sphinx Prince. They even released the Xbox version during the Game Awards. It's categorically one of the best supported video games I can think of. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell for more content like this. Also, feel free to like and share to a friend that may want to hear a good opinion about Baldur's Gate 3. I'm not a fan of deciding which is the best game of the year because they're all so different and great, but Baldur's Gate 3 is really up there if not my favorite game of the year and probably the decade so far. Anyways, leave a comment about your favorite games of the year, about what things you liked and did not like about this game, and I'll see you soon with another video related to impatience in video games. Take care.